You've heard it said, if Jesus was not resurrected, well, then the whole Christian faith, well, it doesn't have a leg to stand on. Have you heard that? Or you've made, perhaps you've heard this statement. The bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ is the most important event in all of history. Have you heard this? These are bold statements. I remember as a young believer hearing this and thinking to myself, really? Hmm. I mean, surely there are other equally important events as the resurrection. I mean, what, about, what about the six days of creation? That was a big deal, right? What about when God tabernacled with his people in Israel, a column of fire by night and a pillar of cloud in the day? That's a big event. What about the incarnation of Christ? What about his indwelling spirit at the point of salvation? Big events. But to now say that the resurrection is the most important? We're going to have to back this up. How does one do it? Well, listen as I read from one writer. He claims this bold statement and he backs it up. The bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ is the most important event in history, providing irrefutable evidence that Jesus is who he claimed to be, the very Son of God. The resurrection was not only the supreme validation of his deity, it also validated the scriptures, which he foretold his coming and resurrection. Moreover, it authenticated Christ's claims that he would be raised on the third day. If Christ's body was not resurrected, we have no hope that ours will be. In fact, apart from Christ's bodily resurrection, we have no savior, no salvation, and no hope of eternal life. As the Apostle Paul said, our faith would be useless and the life-giving power of the gospel would be altogether eliminated. Essentially, the argument being put forward is this. Without the bodily resurrection of Christ, the Christian faith gets lumped together with any other myth or some fly-by-night cult that pops up. One could just as easily believe in and celebrate flying pink unicorns or Easter bunnies that lay golden eggs or chocolate eggs or perhaps the tooth fairy? Or what about little green leprechauns with their little pot of gold at the end of the rainbow? That's what the Christian faith would be lumped into. Same category without the resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus is what authenticates our faith. And this, of course, this is our topic. And I say this morning, we throw our lot in with those who have made the bold statement. If Jesus was not resurrected, then the whole Christian faith, well, it doesn't have a leg to stand on. This is Resurrection Sunday, and we, with millions and millions of others around the world, we've set aside this day to mark and to remember and to celebrate this historical event that has genuinely taken place. We're exploring the ramifications of an empty tomb, and we're celebrating our findings. Grab your Bibles. Turn in your copy of God's Word. I love saying that. I love saying that every Sunday morning. You've got on your laps the words of God. Isn't that incredible? Open the pages of ancient Scripture which were supernaturally revealed to us, completely inerrant, fully inspired, absolutely trustworthy, preserved and handed down from generation to generation, and we have it sitting in our hands. Incredible. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. As we survey the passage written by the Apostle Paul, which discusses and argues and defends the resurrection of man as well as Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 12 to 19. 
This entire chapter is a must read on the topic of Christ's resurrection. But for this morning, we're just going to be looking at 12 to 19, because I know you probably have a roast in the oven, right? All right. Follow along as I read, starting in verse 12. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there's no resurrection of the dead? But if there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he has raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. Verse 16, for if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is futile. You're still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, well, then we are of all people most to be pitied. That's our text. Let's pray. Father God, on this Lord's Day, which has been set apart for remembering and for celebrating the risen Christ, we join arms with the faithful around the globe in lifting up our voices in praise, in thanks, and in adoration. And just as you enabled your beloved son to arise from the grave, would you enable us, your church, the bride of Christ, a sweet, unending praise and heartfelt gratitude, would you enable that within us to continue for all of eternity? As we go through your word this morning, would you help us to grasp the incredible truth of the arisen Christ? And in his name we pray. Amen. All right. So this morning, I'm not going to go through... I'm not going to reinvent the wheel. I'm not going to pick any obscure text of Scripture to look at the resurrection of Christ. We're in the main body of the Apostle Paul's writing of Scripture, which he speaks on the resurrection of the believer as well as Jesus. Now, some pastors this morning might have chosen to read through the book of Jonah, illustrating Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, using the imagery of the big fish swallowing the prophet as, as Jesus is, you know, spending three days. So the prophet being in the belly three days and then being spat up on dry land. And now I know and I believe and I agree that this could be imagery of the crucifixion and the resurrection. But today we're not going there, perhaps in years to come. But this morning, we're examining Paul's description of why the resurrection is absolutely essential to our Christian faith. Now, over the years, theologians have agreed with Paul by identifying a handful of consequences. If Christ had not risen. And we're going to do the same this morning. The Apostle Paul breaks these down for us in verses 12 to 19. If Christ had not risen, first consequence, the preaching of the gospel would be meaningless. Second, faith in Christ would be worthless. If Christ had not risen, third consequence, all witnesses to and all preachers of the resurrection, we'd just be liars. Fourth, all men would still be in their sins. Fifth, if Christ had not risen, then all former believers would have eternally perished. And lastly, if Christ had not risen, Christians would be the most pitiable people on earth. We're going to go through these one by one this morning. These are the consequences if Christ had not risen. And Paul addresses each of these in his writing to the believers in Corinth. At the time of writing, Paul's in Ephesus, and he's paid a visit by some believers from the church in Corinth, where he had previously spent 18 months there planting the church and getting things started. And actually, if you'll, if you'll permit me, I'd like to zoom out even further to, to, to look at Paul's missionary journeys just so we can put together the, the puzzle pieces with a bit more clarity. 
Okay, Acts 17 tells the reader that the believers in Berea were concerned for Paul's life. So there, the Jews had heard of Paul, the Jews from Thessalonica, and they were coming to Berea and they were wanting to persecute Paul, they were wanting to slander Paul, they would have loved for Paul to have been arrested. Paul was a thorn in their, their side. Okay, So now the believers in Berea said, Paul, you're just too valuable to the work of God, and we need to get you out of here. We need to literally ship you out of here. They put him on a boat, and they shipped him to Athens, where he would be safe. The Jews hated Paul. And the Berean believers said, we need to keep you safe. Acts 17 tells us this story. And once he arrived in Athens, he had to wait for Silas and Timothy to join him. So we pick up the story quickly in verse 16 of Acts 17. Follow along if you can. Now while Paul was awaiting for them at Athens, now typical Paul, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with whoever happened to be there. So some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what's this babbler saying? Others said, hmm, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he's preaching Jesus and the resurrection. Verse 19, and they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you're presenting to us? For you bring some strange things to our ears and we wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there, they would spend their time doing nothing except telling or hearing of new things. And you're, probably, you're possibly familiar with the scene there. They were always looking for the next thing, the latest fad. We want our ears to be tickled with something new, spiritual, mystical. What's this strange thing you're telling us, Paul? Come up here and stand on the rock of Areopagus and reason with us. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you're very religious. For as I was passing along, I observed the objects of your worship, and I found also an altar with this inscription. To the unknown God, what therefore you worship is unknown. Paul says to the crowd, Allow me to introduce you to him. His name is Jesus. And Paul preached Christ's birth, his incarnation. He preached his whole sinless life. He preached his death on the cross, his burial, and he preached Christ's resurrection. No doubt he gave them the whole gospel message. And though the Athenians were steeped in mystic beliefs and Greek Gnosticism, through his preaching and reasoning with these highly spiritual people, Paul had won a handful of converts to Christianity that day. Acts 17.34. The thing to know is that in Athens, Athens was ground zero for Greek Gnosticism. And Corinth is just a short journey up the road. So when Silas and Timothy had joined him, they went up to Corinth to do the church work there, the planting. Now that's more background and context for our passage today in 1 Corinthians 15. Paul's writing to these believers in Corinth, reminding them of what he had already preached and what they had already believed. Okay? The beliefs, though, of the Greek Gnostics were so far-reaching and influential, it was difficult to break away from. Remember, in, in Gnosticism, death was, was welcomed, in a sense. It, it was the spirit separating from the physical. And that was a good thing in Gnosticism. They believed all things to do with the spirit are good, all things to do with the body, physically, well, that's bad. Okay? Allow me to give you a little bit of a, a, a quick drive-by summary of Gnosticism at the time when Paul evangelized and started the church in Corinth. Okay? They believed in a supreme creator God. And this supreme creator God gave as a task to this lesser God 
Now you go create Earth and everything on it. Well, I'm giving you that task. So he did, this, this lesser god, <laughs> and he botched the job. He messed everything up. He, uh, he, 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 he made an absolute wreck of it, and it happens by accident. He placed in the hearts of humanity a flicker or a piece of the spirit of the true God. And so at the core of the spirit, each man was good and truth. Okay? That's, that's the core of Gnosticism. Spirit is good, physical body is bad. And so you can imagine just the notion of the spirit being resurrected with the body, well, that's repugnant to these Gnostics. It was not well received at all. But as always, God is able to break through this. He's more than able to open the eyes of the most hardened and adamant unbeliever or even Gnostic. And this is what happened at Corinth. And we all know, though, again, old ways die hard, don't they? Just some circumcision was difficult for Jewish believers to let go of. Similarly, people in Corinth coming to saving faith in Christ out of Gnosticism. They had, they had this belief of the division of spirit and body, and this was their Achilles heel. And doesn't Satan always know our Achilles heel, our weak spot? And he goes straight for it every time. That's interesting, not, not because Satan is omniscient, rather because Satan has had thousands of years to observe humanity. And he's a great observer, takes notes. He knows our weakness. Interestingly, for these particular Corinthians, the main issue wasn't whether Jesus had resurrected or not, but rather if believers would one day rise. Okay, so would believers one day receive and be given the glorified body as Christ had? So it's, it's kind of a, a disconnect. And this is the reason for Paul's writing. Let's look back a little bit in chapter 15, starting in verse 1. He says this, Brothers, let me remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, on which you stand, and by which you're being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance the exact same thing which I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. He was buried. He was raised on the third day. Again, in accordance with the scriptures. And then he appeared to Cephas. He appeared to the twelve. He then appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time most of whom are still alive today. Some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and to all the apostles. Paul, Paul here, is, he's reminding the Corinthians that he preached the resurrected Christ. He preached the whole gospel. And you received it. And it's on this you stand. It's by this which you're saved. Paul says, I preached to you the very same message the risen and glorified Christ had delivered to me on the road to Damascus. It seems as though these Corinthians accepted the bodily resurrection of Jesus, but they were still wrestling with the believer's resurrection. Couldn't quite wrap their minds around it. Paul says, you can't have one without the other. They're linked. The apostle had direct revelation from God, which he, he ter in turn gives to the church in a, in a very shepherdly, loving, pastoral way. And he, he, you can see it when he's writing these epistles. Paul does this for the believers in Thessalonica as well. Some of the church members had died, and these new believers were thinking, oh no, those who have died, well, they're going to miss out on the rapture. So Paul addresses this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, starting in verse 13. He says, we don't want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. 
For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord. What an incredible picture. To meet the Lord in the air. And see, we will always be with the Lord. So don't worry. Those who are asleep, those, those church members who have passed away, don't worry. We'll meet them in the air. In fact, they'll be risen first and join Christ, and we'll join him later. Paul ends with, therefore, encourage one another with these words. Now, if the dead are not raised, then there is no comfort or encouragement at all for the loved one of these deceased believers. For these deceased Christians would indeed miss out on the second coming of Christ if he had not risen. Those who have fallen asleep in Christ, well, they would be lost if Christ had not risen. It would be meaningless for you to even be here this morning. It would be meaningless for me to preach the gospel if Christ had not risen. And that's our first consequence that we're going to go through this morning. Absolutely meaningless to preach the gospel if he had not risen. After all, we know that Christ was victorious over these three evils. Sin, death, and hell. Christ was victorious. Think about that which has plagued mankind since the fall of Adam in the garden. Sin, death, and hell. But if Christ has not risen, then he has not been victorious over these. And it would, again, it would be meaningless to preach for you to be here. That which we call good news, well, it would just be news. And who would even listen to it? If there's no risen Christ, then we have an empty gospel message. A hopeless and meaningless message. I mean, we're all here this morning to remember and celebrate an empty tomb, are we not? But if the tomb had remained full, well, then it's our gospel message that's empty. Let's look at our second consequence. It's found in verse 14. If Christ had not risen, faith in him, it would be worthless. Essentially, the Christian faith would be rendered impotent. Our faith now would be lowered to that of worshiping dead prophets like Buddha and Muhammad. Jesus wouldn't be the Christ. He would just be another dead prophet. Worthless. And our faith, well, it would be in vain. One writer captures the thought perfectly by saying, a dead savior could not give life if the dead do not rise. Christ did not rise and we will not rise. We then could only say with the psalmist, surely in vain I've kept my heart pure. Or the servant Isaiah when he says, I've toiled in vain. I've spent my strength for nothing in vanity. Or in Hebrews 11, when we're looking at the hall of the faithful, well, instead, that would just be the hall of the foolish, wouldn't it? Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Sarah, Moses, Rahab, David, the prophets, and all the others would have been faithful for nothing. They would have been mocked, scourged, imprisoned, stoned, afflicted, ill-treated, put to death, completely in vain. All believers of all ages would have believed for nothing, lived for nothing, died for nothing. What a bleak picture. So all faith in Jesus, well, it would just be worthless. It's a horrible thought, isn't it? Let's look at our third consequence found in verse 15. 
if Christ had not risen, then all the witnesses of this risen Christ and all preachers of the resurrection are simply liars. In essence, isn't that what Lee Strobel set out to do? The former award-winning legal editor of the Chicago Tribune, great story, I'm sure most of us know it, he was a staunch atheist. And his wife came to Saving Faith in Christ, and he was so annoyed by this that he set out, it was his personal life mission to just prove the whole thing a big fat lie. I mean, that was his job investigative journalist, legal editor, that Jesus was either a myth or a madman. And if anybody could prove this, he would. And after much investigating, Strobel arrived at the conclusion that Jesus was neither a myth nor a madman, but a legitimate historical figure that had genuinely died a brutal death and was buried and three days later, miraculously, had risen back to life with over 500 witnesses. The conclusion Strobel landed on was that Jesus of Nazareth was neither a myth nor a madman, but rather Messiah. He then authored the book Case for Christ and multiple other books. Something else to consider. If Christ had not risen, well, then Satan would have won, right? Remember on Friday, knowing his death was near, Jesus announced that the hour had come. The hour when the enemy is defeated. This includes Jesus' death, his burial, and his resurrection. We, we talked about this on Friday evening. Well, listen to Hebrews 2, starting in verse 14. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might, listen, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver all those through, who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it's not the angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Had Jesus not risen, Satan would not have been defeated. The victory won on the cross is hinged to the resurrection. Let's move on now to our fourth consequence, found in verse 17. If Christ had not risen all mankind would still be in their sins. As Christians, we describe ourselves as new creations, right? We're forgiven. We're the redeemed. We're justified. But without the resurrection, we and all mankind, we would still be lost in our trespasses and sin. Romans, Paul says in Romans 4.22, he describes Abraham's strong faith in believing God and that he would fulfill his promises. That's why his faith was counted to him as righteousness, but the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Hallelujah. If he was not raised, we're not justified. If he was not raised, our trespasses, they're not forgiven. The empty tomb and bodily resurrection of Christ was essential. As it was essential for the Apostle Paul's doctrine of justification, which were given in Romans. Let's move on to our fifth consequence. Found in verse 18. If Christ had not risen, all former believers would have eternally perished. Remember those that we talked about had described as fallen asleep? Those would be eternally perished. Old Testament and New Testament saints alike, all people of faith who have passed away, 
dust, perished. What I'm saying is, if the tomb is not empty, there'll be no great reunion. Not, there'll be no reunion with our Lord or with our deceased loved ones, the woes who were in faith. Without the risen Christ, all have perished. Just a few verses down in, in chapter 15, Paul uses a term to describe Jesus. It's a beautiful term. He describes Jesus as the first fruits. Look down in verse 20 of chapter 15. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. So you'll remember a verse from the Gospels that says, the harvest is plentiful, the laborers are few. That's Luke 10, verse 2. Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord that the harvest, Lord of the harvest would send out laborers into his harvest. So we're given in the Old Testament a beautiful illustration of Christ and his followers as the first fruits of the harvest. So before the Israelites would uh, harvest their crops, they were to bring a sample. It's described to us in Leviticus 23. They were to bring a sample, their first fruits of their crop. And they were to give it to the high priest as an offering to the Lord. One commentator explains this really well. The full harvest could not be made until the first fruits were offered. That is the point of Paul's figure here. Christ's own resurrection was the first fruits of the resurrection harvest, of the believing dead. In his death and resurrection, Christ made an offering of himself to the Father on our behalf. The significance of the first fruits, though, not only was that they preceded the harvest, but that they were a first installment of the harvest. The fact that Christ was the first fruits, therefore, indicates there's more. There's more to come. Namely, the harvest of the rest of the crop. It's still to follow. In other words, Christ's resurrection could not have been in isolation from ours. His resurrection requires our resurrection because his resurrection was part of the larger resurrection of God's redeems. Isn't it? It's an amazing picture because because he is risen, we too shall rise. All we who belong to this great harvest. How encouraging. These are the many, many consequences. We've only looked at a few today, but there are many consequences to consider if Christ had not risen. Let's look at our last one that we'll consider this morning. It's found in verse 19. Christians would be the most pitiable people on earth. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. If Christ had not risen, the world would be fully justified in saying, oh, you poor, poor, naive, and gullible Christians. You placed your faith in vain. Your gospel is meaningless. You worship Christ, and it's just worthless. Your preachers are liars. All of humanity is still stuck in sin, and you're never to rejoin the saints of old. You are the most pitiable people on earth. And if anyone ever said that, they'd be absolutely correct if Christ had not risen. Christianity would be pointless. Without the resurrection, we'd have no savior. No forgiveness, no gospel, no meaningful faith, no life, no hope. But we have hope, don't we? The Father, the Father would not let his holy one see corruption. We have hope. Acts 2 verse 22. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus 
delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men, God raised him up and loosed the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he's at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. For you'll not abandon my soul to Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You've made known to me the paths of life, and you will make me full of gladness with your presence. He is indeed present. He's living. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father. Therefore, believers, today, we too can be full of the same gladness, hope, and joy. And we can say with confidence, Jesus has risen. He has risen indeed. Our hearts should be overflowing this morning. He has made us glad. Let's close in prayer. Father, this morning, you have shown us your love. For while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And now we have been justified by his blood. Now we have been saved by Christ from the wrath we deserved. For while we were still sinners, while we were still very much enemies, you reconciled us to yourself by the death of your son. Now we're reconciled. We're saved by his life. And today, this Resurrection Sunday, we rejoice. We rejoice in you and our almighty God and our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have received reconciliation. And now we too can look forward to either a glorious resurrection or a spectacular rapture. Whichever you choose, since we, Father, we long to live in the center of your perfect will. And we pray that you'd be glorified in your church here this morning. And it's in the incredible, matchless name of our Lord Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.